Okay, and welcome back to Fast Shit Performance then. My name is Tim Davies, and this is, I believe, episode 11 of Ask FJP, where you get to ask me questions, and I get to tell you the answers about what's happening with the United Kingdom military flying training system, or just being a pilot in Her Majesty's Royal Air Force. Okay, and what I decided about on this episode was to talk to you a little bit about the GROB 120TP, which is the aircraft that we're bringing in for our elementary flying training. Now, I went out to Bavaria to visit the Grob factory and have a look at the aircraft in March this year. And when I arrived at the factory, the first thing that actually happened was a guy took me into a room and he said, hey, would you like some free things, some clothing and this kind of thing? It's a bit unusual for me, really, because obviously I'm a British military officer. So I said, nein, Herr Grob, I am a British military officer and I cannot be bought. All right. So, let me tell you about this visit. Let's get rid of these for a second. Ah, does it even work? These glasses, they're actually not too bad. They've got Grob written all over it. Born to fly, Grob, born to fly. I'm looking gangster, I know, I'm looking gangster. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Grob 120TP then. Uh, I've got a bit of a script here, and I'm not gonna read you out the script because that would be silly, but I want the uh, narration to kind of match the pictures that we're gonna put in there for you. So, let's have a bit of a think about what we're gonna talk about. I really wanna talk initially about just blogging and why I blog. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about obviously the, the factory facilities and what I kind of saw on out to Bavaria. Then we'll talk about the aeroplane and really how the aircraft is going to integrate, what it does, what the good things about the aircraft are, but also what are the things that are causing me some concern as a requirements manager that has to bring this platform into service. What are the problems of blogging, as I said? Um, what happened on the last blog, when I put that one out about the Texan T6, and you can find the link for that, go and have a look at that if you want. Some guys in the office came up to see me and people were uncomfortable about blogging. Uh, and they said, oh, you can't release that information. Well, I can, in fact. The whole of the United Kingdom military flying training system is unrestricted. Now, the courseware and the information that's put out there is commercial in confidence, because the last thing you want to do after a sent flight training and spent hours writing all this stuff is for someone to come up, copy their courseware, and then put it into their own flying training system which is why I don't publish any courseware or put anything out there like that that the company wouldn't want me to do. However, the whole of the flying training system is unrestricted. It has to be because of the fact it has so many civilians involved with it. That's understandable. These glasses are really annoying. Now, have a look at this. This is the Chief of Air Staff's Twitter page. In August, I did a sea drill with the Chief of Air Staff. There was myself, there was him, and his personal staff officer. Just three of us floating around the sea in dinghies pretending that we just ejected from an airplane and we had to bail stuff out and look after ourselves. Now, I had a chat to him about this. He doesn't like Twitter very much. This is uh, ACM uh, Steve Hillier. He's a lovely guy. And the PSO was the guy who's about to take over the station commander of Coningsby, running the typhoons out of Coningsby. Lovely guy also. And we all agreed that actually social media was a bit difficult. How much information do you release? But we also agreed that it was very important to release information because you have to keep people on side, on board. And at the end of the day, the public, it's the taxpayers' money that keep the Air Force actually flying. It's very important, which is why I do this. Now, some people don't understand that. So haters are going to hate. A lot of those haters are actually people that I work with every day. <sighs> Whatever, okay? I'm kind of pretty bulletproof, really. The RF presentation team also engaged heavily with the public. And if you want to follow one of those two Twitter accounts, you'll, you'll get a lot of engagement from them. So it is recognized that there is an engagement strategy. And that's what I take part in. And the chief of staff has said that we have to engage. So if you're watching this and you're in the military and you're not engaging, well, actually, you're going against the Chief of Air Staff's directive. So you've got to have to think about that. So let's go out to Bavaria. This is a picture of the airfield, hopefully. This is Tissenhausen in Bavaria. It's got its own factory, its own design team, own hospitality aspects, and it's got its own airfield. So when Grob make these airplanes, they fly and they test them from their own little airstrip in the Bavarian forest. It's just absolutely an amazing place. Very enjoyable to go out there. As I said, obviously they have completely merged me up, um, which is brilliant. Look at this, look at this jacket. Look at these, these are the guys that bought the airplane. This is Grob aircraft down here. This is brilliant, because this is gonna get me in trouble as well. People are going, you took gifts off Grob, and they're gonna completely neglect the fact that all the senior Air Force people and politicians go and have drinks and everything with, with corporations, and they never declare that stuff, do they? They were throwing this stuff out. Oh, you can't publicize the fact you got things from Grob. You got to... Grob are a great company, got a lot of time for them, and they make some great clothing, as well as airplanes. All right, whatever. I will blog about this next time, and I will tell you how much trouble I got in for it showing you that Grog gave me a jumper to wear and a keychain and a key fob and some bling bling glasses. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the factory Grob and we saw our first two aircraft on the actual factory itself in the factory being designed. 
Um, they were at the stage where they were getting the, um, the carbon composite put on the side of them. They were on their side. They were getting some avionics put in also. So I've got a picture of that now that's going to come up. Um, great people at Grok, really hospitable. They were awesome. They really looked after us. When I say that because we just bought 23 of their airplanes, I haven't bought 23 of their airplanes. Something I really want you to understand is uh, how they because I get a lot of comments in YouTube and they're quite vociferous really. And I think it is a lack of understanding. Now, I set a requirement. So the team that I'm in, we set requirements. So what I say is, I don't say, I want you to give me a Grob 120TP, I want you to give me a Texan T6C, I want you to give me a Hawk T2, I don't say that. I don't say I want you to give me a, an Airbus 135, 145 helicopter, and I want you to give me a Phenom 100. No, I don't say that. What I say is, these are the requirements for the entry standard to a Typhoon and a Tornado GR4 OCU, okay? This guy has to have all these things. Or this is the entry standard to the Puma, or the Merlin, or the C-17, or whatever it might be, or the RPAS OCU, Operational Conversion Unit, when they learn to fly the frontline types. They have to have a certain amount of skill set. So in the requirements, what I do is I put down in that, they have to be able to navigate at low level. They have to be able to do air combat. Uh, they have to be able to do some radar work. Now, I don't care. I don't even get asked what aircraft these guys are gonna go and buy. Under UK and FTS, we spoke a little bit about it last time. United Kingdom Military Flying Training System. Ascent Flight Training, which is Lockheed Mark, Martin and Babcock, they won that contract. So they are the training service provider. They provide the training, which makes a lot of sense. The training is buildings, it's aircraft, it's also people, it's um, management information systems that looks after all the courseware, all the lesson plans. They provide the IT, uh, infrastructure, everything. Okay, um, The air bases belong to the Air Force, of course. So... That's a big job for them, and it's worth a lot of money. Now, what they did is they went and they subcontracted the purchasing and the delivery of the aircraft to another company, and that company was called Affinity. It was made up of Elbip, which is an Israeli company, and KBR, Kellogg Brown and Root, which is an American company, I believe. I believe they are. Could be wrong. They set that company up called Affinity, and they're called the Aircraft Service Provider. Their responsibility is to bring aircraft in. So again, Ascent went to them. They said, guys, I want you to bring some aircraft in to service these requirements. And Affinity said, okay, we're gonna go and pick these aircraft, whatever, and we're gonna bring them in. Lots of chat. If they brought in one airplane that could do everything, the Air Force would have been happy with that. If they were gonna bring in two aircraft that could do everything, the Air Force would have been happy with that. They're bringing in three aircraft to do everything. So yeah, the Air Force is happy with that. In fact, some in the Air Force are not overly happy with that. Some in the Air Force recognize that a lot of militaries are actually going to a two aircraft solution. They're going for an elementary slash basic trainer, and then they're gonna move on to an advanced trainer. In our Air Force, that's gonna train uh, the Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy, and the Army. We're actually going for a three aircraft structure. And that's because the Hawk T2 from BA Systems was bought kind of early. That's what I fly in the tactical weapons phase, fast jet phase four in effect flying training. We have a basic and we have, well, we have an advanced flying training and then we have attack weapons on the same aircraft on the same squadron. That's what I do in my other time, of course, which is why they pay me so much money. They don't pay me too much money, by the way. So what happened is Ascent Flight Training thought they'd bring in two more aircraft to proceed that one. It's a very traditional system it kind of works, but it kind of could also be done a little bit differently. Now, not this stage, we're too far down the line, the aircraft being bought already. Anyway, so what do they buy? Well, if you think about the system we used to have, and we still have moving forward, really, we used to have, well, we have, we have the Grob 115, um, that is a propeller aircraft piston, that's in elementary flying training, and you do, you fly that first before you go on to basic flying training. I'm talking about the fast jet line now. Everyone flies the Grob, but then after that, the multi guys go on to 45 squadron onto the King Air, uh, the rotary guys go to Shawbury, and then the fast jet guys go and fly the Takano at 1FTS Linton News. Okay, they get some hours on that, and then after the Takano, they go on to, they used to go on to the Hawk T1, they go on to the Hawk T2 now. And then they go from there onto the Typhoon F35 GR4, whatever it might be. Lots of figures, lots of numbers. I'm just trying to get some detail out here for you. I'll put some pictures up here. Now, here's the thing. That's gonna change, because the aircraft are gonna change, but we're still gonna have elementary, basic, used to be called basic fast jet flying training. It's now called basic flying training. It's a bit confusing, elementary and basic. We'll go with it. And then advanced. Basic fast jet is in the middle. This is the platform that was the Texan T2 that I talked about last week. So today we're talking about elementary flying training. 
So when people flash up in the YouTube comments about the fact that I've gone and bought a Grob 120TP and how bad am I, I could have just bought PC21 and combined the Texan T6 and the 120, yeah, I didn't buy anything. I didn't buy anything at all. We set requirements that the training service provider satisfy and how they satisfy them, we couldn't care less, but they need to satisfy them, that's very important. So the Air Force isn't buying any aircraft at all. The aircraft will be bought for the Air Force, Air Force under an MOD agreement type screen. Work it out, it's maths. Okay, but here's the thing about numbers, and numbers are quite important. When we look at the numbers that we used to have, it gets kind of interesting. With the Grob Tutor, uh, which is in service now, this is the Grob 115, we had 170 of those aircraft. Spread across university air squadrons, uh, elementary flying training, uh, Navy down at RS, RAS, Yoberton. Um, we had 160 Decano, Shorts Decano Mark I. And we had 116 Hawk T1s. Now when we look at the aircraft we brought in to replace them, the new Grob 120 TP, what's going to be called the Prefect, and there's a reason it's going to be called the Prefect before you all flash up and tell me how bad the name it is. Okay, because I know you will. Um, we're buying 23 of those 120 TPs. We're buying 10 Texan T6Cs. And we're buying 28, we have bought 28 Hawk T2s. Very much reduced amount. Now why is that? Why is that reduced amount? Well, things have changed. A lot's changed in fact. So in effect, synthetics and simulated technology has come a long way. So we can do a lot of what we did in the air on the ground. It's a lot cheaper. Is it as good? Probably not. Have I got instructors that keep flying in the air the whole time? No, I haven't, okay? So manpower, less, lots less. So um, aircraft can be less as well. Now, what else? Service length, yes. Yeah, so when we bought the Hawk T1, that was in service and it still is in service today. It's been in for 42 years. And it's gonna be over 50 years before you get rid of that platform. Still flying with the Red Arrows, 736 Squadron uh, under Lieutenant Commander Barry Zitt down at um, Cold Rose. And also it's flying up at 100 Squadron as well. And it's got some Royal Air Force Center of Aviation Medicine stuff, elementary test pilot school. So that is still flying. Okay, that's gonna be an old airframe. Well, we're not expecting these airframes we buy now or are being bought for us now to be in for that length of time. Of course, they probably will be, but we're not expecting it, which is why we can do with less. Also, their flight hours they can do, the service life of the airplane is significantly longer. When we had the T1, I believe the life of that aircraft was about 9,000 hours. I think it was less than that and it got extended. Well, the life of the Texan is 18,000 hours, and they've tested it three times that. The life of the aircraft I'm talking about today, the 120 TP, is 15,000 hours. I mean, that's significant, okay? So as you can see, um, we're not expecting the aircraft to be in that long. We can buy smaller numbers and we can fly more often. Whether that's gonna work or not, we don't know. A lot of people that I work with on flying squadrons believe it won't. A lot of people I work with in my requirement space believe that it probably will. So there's a balance, all right, there's a balance. Uh, okay, but as Stalin said, quantity has a quality all of its own. Not that I want Stalin to come and run our flying training system, that would be a very bad idea, of course, he has been dead a long time. However, he was talking about tanks and personnel that Russia was putting out of the Second World War at the time. And the reason that I bring that quote up about quantity versus quality uh, is because of the fact that if we were to kill a uh, Hawk T2, for example, say we were to crash one into the ground, um, I don't know, it gets attacked by a pterodactyl or something and, and we can't use the aircraft again or it flies into a bird and loses part of the wing, we land it and it's out of service for six months. That's one out of 28 aircraft that are on the ground now. So that's about three mass, 0.6, 0.7, something like that, 3.7, something like that, almost 4% of your airframes that are out. Now, if you lose a Texan T6C, well, that's one of 10, that's 10% if you crash one of those or you put a hole in the wing or damage it, that's 10% gone, okay? Now, if you lose a Phenom 100, only buying five of those, that's 20% out. All you gotta do is hit a bird in that thing, 20% of your assets are now not flying. That's really, really significant. Back in the 1930s, there was an aircraft called the Avro Tutor. Uh, then, from the Avro Tutor, they bought an aircraft back in the 35, I believe it was, called the Avro Prefect. And that taught people how to fly all the aircraft they were gonna fly in the future, like Spitfires, Hurricanes, that kind of stuff. So, the name Prefect has an historic connotation. It's just not, um, it's, we're not trying to be silly with the name. I didn't name it. It's obviously a very senior officer um, with guidance from a historical branch that came up with the name Prefect. And it is steeped in history, so fine. That's why it's gonna be called the Prefect. It's gonna be in service then pretty much early 2018. Uh, first instructors will be on at that time, getting themselves spun up over about six months. First students late 2018, really. Based out of RF Barks and Heath. In fact, the first two aircraft are landing, I believe it's the 7th of November this year. First two of them, I'll show you a picture of them now. Um, they're gonna be flying 
um, over here. And then I think we're going to send them back. We're going to put them in a shed and just do some maintenance work on them and learn how to take these jets apart and to service them, okay? So they're going to be in the country for about a year before we actually do anything with them. Okay, so what's the syllabus going to look like on this particular airplane? Synthetic, obviously a lot of sim work as well with this. Uh, it's going to have different syllabuses within it, so different phases in it, and uh, those phases are effects of controls, uh, straight and level, um, spinning, climbing and descending. It's a lot of circuit work, shudder. Oh, circuits, a nightmare. Uh, stalling will be in there. Practice force landings, and we'll talk about that in a minute because it's got a bit of an issue with practice force landings. Um, steep turns, aerobatics, and it is awesome at aerobatics, by the way. Max rate turns. A max rate turn is where you fly the aircraft on the light buffet, and it's a way of getting you used to that light buffet. Max performing the lift on the wing, because that's what you're going to be doing in combat. Um, formation flying, you'll do a lot of that. I said spinning already, uh, instrument flying, very important. We're gonna do a lot of that in it as well. A lot of navigation work, um, a lot of low level work. And then we're gonna have a composite phase where we put all those things together and we test the skill set of the student. Very interesting uh, syllabus it's gonna be, okay? Engine, it's a turboprop. It's a Rolls-Royce M250B17F. Uh, it's used, it's a turboprop, but it's normally used in helicopters. They put it in an aircraft here. And the reason they've done that is it's got a very linear response. It feels very jet-like and when I flew the aircraft, the response was there straight away. It felt, it felt jet-like, you know, I'm getting power from this thing. Um, it's 460 shaft horsepower as max rating, 380 if you're gonna sustain. Remember the T6 was double that, in effect, 1100 shaft horsepower. This aircraft has a five blade, um, constant speed carbon composite prop. Uh, it's an interesting propeller actually, and as I said, it's there designed spinning at the same speed to deliver this jet-like performance. Picture of the engine, cool. It has winglets, and I'll show you a picture of the winglets now. What am I doing on this screen? Um, and the winglets mean that actually you don't need to put much rudder in at all. In fact, hardly any, it just goes straight. So that's great, we don't need to use rudder anymore. Um, why would we, it's 2016, Who uses rudder. Okay, has a primary flight display, no head up display. Don't, why would you want a head up display in aircraft like this? You don't want a head up display. Um, has primary flight display then, and I'll show you a picture of those now. It has um, various features, it can either have tape, or it can have dials, <clears throat> and it can obviously resemble an F-16 or an F-18 structure of head-up display, and you can change that how you want. I'll try and put pictures up those. Common avionics, um, four screens then, eight by six inches each, very big screens, and they're divided horizontally into primary flight information or navigational stuff. Each cockpit really is a, each side of the cockpit is a, like a cockpit in itself. So you're not reaching to the other guy's screens. You've literally got your world in front of you. It's very impressive. Student sits on the right, instructor sits on the left. You each have a left-hand throttle. Instructor on the left-hand side has a throttle up here by the edge of the canopy. That has an issue. And I'll talk about the issue later. In the future, it will be able to display air-to-air -air radar. It will do um, synthetic ground um, defensive threats. And it will also do um, defensive aid threats and stuff like that. But we're not that's not with it now. That's not something that we'll probably ever use. Uh, why would you need that sort of thing at what we're doing with it in elementary flying training? But later on, of course, you might want to bring that in if you're using it as a two-part solution to your flying training system and not like we are where we're doing it as a three-part. There's going to be a lot of overlap in our flying training system, as I'm sure you clever people are aware of now. Um, and yeah, it's a bit of an issue. We're, we're still trying to work that out. As I said, we're trying to work it out. All right, uh, what else did we say? Yeah, very spacious seating, um, throttles on the left with both occupants, which is quite important. Um, it's a very low cost of acquisition and operation for this platform, which is obviously why Affinity went and bought it. It's a complete carbon fiber airplane. So they use a wet carbon fiber technique where they mix the sheets of carbon fiber with resin at room temperature, and that then sets, and there's a, uh, there's a reason for that, and that has an issue on the paint that we can use on the aircraft, and it's to do with thermal stresses. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, has a traffic advisory system, digital flight display, uh, copper voice recorder, very advanced avionics systems by Cobham, which is quite good. Has a flight data recorder and a cockpit voice recorder also. Has a mission debriefing system, but I think we're buying one universal system that we're going to put across all our aircraft. I can't remember, that's a different bit. Has a very high service life on the airframe, as I said, 15,000 hours. That is quite impressive for uh, this aircraft. There is no ejection seat in this airplane. You can fit one, not the ones we bought, but if you restructure the airframe, it is heavier, obviously, we can put a, um, an ejection seat in that, but we haven't, I say we, um, whoever's bought this airplane, Affinity and, and uh, Ascent, have not put an ejection seat in the airplane, and anything above about 180 knots, whatever, abandonment proves a bit difficult, so we have some workarounds for that. Uh, basically, don't get yourself in the trouble above 180 knots, you should be fine. Okay, plus six, minus four G airframe, 
Uh, the max speed of the aircraft is about 235 knots. It's going to cruise about 180 knots around. 3,000 foot per minute rate of climb. It's quite impressive actually. When I flew it, we just got airborne and literally we were up to the operating area before you could. I, I was behind the jet. I was like, where the hell? What the hell's going on? We're here. Um, about 700 nautical mile range, really, if you're going to ferry the jet anywhere. Uh, and really, it's got we can have five and a half hour endurance if you want. If you want to sit there and get exceptionally bored. Um, 25,000 feet is ceiling. There's an issue here because we haven't put, when I say we, the aircraft service provider have not put oxygen in the airplane and they also haven't put air conditioning. And when I flew, it was quite hot. Okay, right, who's flying it now then? Argentina, Indonesia, Jordan, Mexico, Myanmar, which I think was Burma. Uh, we've obviously got it and so is the United States. What are the issues then? We don't want to drag this thing out for too long, another quick three or four minutes. Because there are some issues, and this is why I get into trouble, because um, we're open, engaging with the public and everything, and I think it's important that we just discuss these things. They're out there, they're not secret. The issues that we're gonna have, well, conspicuity is a big factor for us. We don't particularly like our aircraft being painted white, so they're quite difficult to see. The problem being, if you notice, the Texan T6 is gonna be black, the Hawk T2 is black. Black and yellow, like the Decano, is uh, a great color. Look at wasps, you notice wasps, don't you? Black and yellow, fact, always see a wasp. Um, we'd rather paint them black and yellow. However, uh, these are painted white. Now, the top surface of, they're painted in the same color scheme as the Fenner 100 is gonna be painted, but the reason that the Grob 120TP is painted white is because of the process that they use for the carbon fiber. We cannot paint it black because of thermal stress. The top wing gets heated up and then it can deform. And this can be a problem, obviously, because now you're flying an aircraft that's deformed. So you need it to be white. On the bottom, we've painted it blue. However, the blue we painted it is a bit kind of sky blue, which again makes it difficult to see, doesn't it? So maybe we should have painted that base of it black, but anyway. Decisions well above my pay grade, obviously by some very senior people that want an aircraft to look quite nice. Good. Has a canopy arch. Lookout is very good, especially to the rear, which is very impressive, and to the top. And actually down the side of the, uh, the instrument combing, you can actually look out there. So when you're flying low level, you can look down and you can see and judge a height above the ground visually, which is a great thing. Um, it's got a rad out anyway, a radar altimeter. However, comma, um, there's this canopy arch. So when you're flying, if you're in the right-hand seat and you're in a left-hand turn, when you're looking out, you do have quite a thick arch in the way there. So you have to look around it. But that's a good thing, because we're teaching students to get their head out. Our aircraft on the front line have canopy arches. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. We can not overload the student. There's gonna be a moving map and there's a lot of data. So we're gonna have to really restrict that at this stage, else you'll just destroy a student's mind. That is a fact. No oxygen. Can't fly above 10,000 feet now, because that's not oxygen. That's a bad thing. It was like a weight saving thing where they wanted to put some more equipment in it, so they did. Uh, they saved 20 kilograms, so they removed the oxygen, they removed the air conditioning. Personally, I would have left both in. Um, but this is a decision, as it says, um, was it a requirement to have oxygen in the airplane? No, it was a requirement to get guys through that piece of training and onto the next platform and to make sure you satisfied these things. For example, with the requirements, I might say, has to be able to do BFM. I don't mean BFM necessarily on that platform, I mean BFM on any platform which is why they're saying, yes, we can do it on the, um, the AJT, so the Advanced Jet Train and Hawk T2, fine. Okay, so, but it hasn't got aircon. That's gonna be an issue for us, because it's a hot, because those screens are hot. It's like four massive iPads, and there's a hot engine in front of you. So we're looking at ways, ram air coming into the aircraft, is that enough? We're looking at ways of maybe satisfying and, and looking at that. No oxygen can't fly by 10,000 feet. I was doing aerobatics at 7,000 feet. We're still climbing, so we're gonna have to be a little bit careful of that as well. Um, apparently you can retrofit some of these items. That's not a bad thing. If it becomes a problem, we'll send them back, get the retrofit in. There's no uh, full authority digital engine control or FADEX, so you need to govern that torque yourself, which is easy enough to do. There's, um, there's things that you put your hand up against, an open palm technique, not a drama. You can over the engine though if you're an idiot. Um, when you set fight idle then, there is a gear tone, a gear knock down warning comes up. That's to say you're at idle, you haven't got your gear down. Similar thing to what I said about the T6C, to be honest with you. So um, you can cancel it, but what happens is you bring the throttle back during aeros, it says um, gear, gear, or something along those lines, I can't remember, and of course you reach out and you cancel it. That's setting bad habits, isn't it? Because now when you're downwind and you're a bit maxed out, you brake, roll out, check your dead wing, idle, it says gear, gear, you just cancel it, and then you land with the gear up. So we've got to put some kind of acknowledgement techniques in there. The pilot will have to say, I acknowledge the fact that the gear warning light is on, I do not need my gear, I need to cancel that gear warning light. And we'll work that into it, we'll do something. Uh, what else we've got here? That was part of the European Air Safety Agency that required those sort of things in. Fair enough, I fully understand that. We're, we're a military, we do things slightly different. The G onset rate, so the rate at which you can pull G in this aircraft is 17 Gs per second. It's ferocious. And I was flying, there's no G pads in it, 
and I struggled. I'm used to G-pans. I hated the, putting the G in this airplane. Uh, I really did. It can sustain in a in a descending turn 5G. It can sustain level at 7,000 feet, 3.5G. That's a lot without G-pans. So you really have to have a very good um, g straining maneuver. And we're going to send the guys to the centrifuge first to make sure they are G-ninjas. G-ninja. I can't do that. Okay. When you take off, you stage through takeoff flat. Most aircraft don't. Most aircraft go from when you roll, you do touch and go, you go straight to um, up flat, I think it's called in this airplane, it is up, take off, land and full. You're gonna have to stage through your takeoff flat as you uh, depart. That may have some connotations, I don't know. Um, yeah, so we use more space because it can climb better, 180 knots, you get out of the air very quickly and you will climb during your aerobatic sequence. It's quite a powerful airplane, as I said. Um, it's quite slippery as well, so for formation, you need to a bit more preempt it, you know, um, because if you bring back the wide wheels, just sail past your buddy. Bit embarrassing. Has a bit of reverse thrust, and you can use that in glide circuits that we're going to teach. Uh, for similar engine off, feathering prop, we can actually use a bit of reverse thrust for that. Uh, terrain avoidance warning system it does have. Now, if that does go off, it does mute the rad out. That's not an issue, I don't think so much. But again, we're looking at these things, and um, with a left hand throttle, it looks like if you're going to abandon the aircraft, that could be a bit of an issue that's in the rear position. Um, so these cockpit ergonomics, we've got to work around for that. These are things that we're all going through at the moment just to make sure that we understand the platform fully and we mitigate against the risk of life for flying these guys in it. When you bring any aircraft in, you're going to have some issues. It's like when you go and buy a brand new car, it could be the best car in the world. It's going to have, it's going to have some issues, isn't it? There's going to be some things where you think, I wish I had a better cup holder. You know, I wish my car had a cup holder like the uh, Porsche Panamera. Those cup holders are awesome. Look them up on YouTube if you, uh, if you don't. They come out of the, um, the glove box. They're fantastic. Right, uh, it's got a high PFL speed. If you're going to force land it, right there now, guys, um, it's over 100 knots. That's a pretty big speed to hit the field at. But the checks are really easy in the airplane, okay? They're very conducive. Look, right, I haven't got anything else more for you. Um, bling bling with my tops. I know you love this. It's awesome. I have not worn this ever before, by the way. Someone's going to turn me off for this, and I'm going to have to point out the amount of chief air staffs that leave the Royal Air Force and go work straight for UK aerospace industry. I'm going to have to say that. Am I going to get into trouble again? All right, guys, really appreciate it. Um, one note, please. If you do write to me saying, please give me information about how I can get into the Air Force and no one else can, and I'm better than everyone else, I can't do that because we're open, aren't we? So I have to give you the same information that I give to everyone, all right? A lot of it comes down, if you're going to go to OSC or AIB, it comes down to preparation, guys, okay? And one thing I will tell you right now for free, all right, so I do a bit of coaching, is um, one thing I heard is that when the pressure is really on, we don't rise to the occasion, all we ever do is fall to our highest level of preparation, okay? And have a think about that, it's all about being prepared. Love the tweets, everything else, the Facebook comments uh, and the YouTube comments, mostly this is a long video, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about blogging and a little bit about the flying training system in the beginning. Any questions, please chuck them in there and I'll get on to answering them, okay? Tim Davies, Fast Hit Performance, thanks so much.